Words at War. India. India, land of mystery and oriental magic. The alluring glamour of the Notch Girls. Land of the Taj Mahal. The fearful conjurations of the snake charmers. India, where taboo is the law of the land. I where... see. Uh, look here, old boy. Shh. Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, we're on the air. I know you are. That's what's bothering me. Really, you're doing this all wrong. We are? I assure you, Mr. Costello. In the first place, that travelogue stuff just doesn't go anymore. It, it's outdated. And besides, it's entirely the wrong tone for my book. No, believe me, we'll have to begin another way. Well, this is your program, Mr. Nichols. How would you like to start? Well, that's very decent of you. Uh, how would I start it? Well, now, let's see. Yes. Suppose you take us to a group of Americans who happen to be chatting about India at this moment. Anywhere. You mean through the magic of radio, of course. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Oh, Charlie, will you switch us to the X transmitter? We're going to make magic. And while you're doing that, let's have some theme music. <laughs> Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents another program in the widely discussed series, Words at War, dramatizing the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Tonight's book was written by the English novelist and essayist, Beverly Nichols, who of course will be impersonated. His book is a record of personal observances on one of the most urgent and absorbing problems of modern times. Its title, Verdict on India. Did you make the changeover, Charlie? Fine. Now, Mr. Nichols, if you're ready, we'll move on to some American conversation. Okay, we're allies. I realize that, and we've got to stick together. But if you ask me, I think the situation in India has a very peculiar odor. Now, you see, there's something I can get my teeth into. Provocative, eh? Well, what now? I, I tell you what. You go over and introduce me to them. Okay. And the sooner Britain quits India, the better it'll be for... Uh, can I help you? Well, pardon me for interrupting, but I'm from the Words at War program. Have a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I. Uh, that is, we happen to overhear your conversation just now, and our guest for the evening happens to be a writer who spent some time in India. Mm. Thought maybe you'd like to meet him. Why, sure. sure. Yeah. Bring him over. Mr. Nichols. Gentlemen, may I present Mr. Beverly Nichols? How, How, do, you do, do, How do you do, sir? Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you the fellow who wrote Verdict on India? Yes, I am. Did you happen to read it? No, oh, sir, not me. Britain's got too many apologists as it is. Oh, an Anglophile, eh? Better than that, my dear sir. An Englishman. Oh, an Englishman. Well, look here, let's not get off on the wrong foot. I just wanted to get in on your little chat. I, I've already overheard some of it. We're a liberty-loving democracy, Mr. Nichols. That's right. You can't subjugate one-fifth of the world's population forever. No, How sir. right you are about that, sir. Oh, you agree, huh? I uh, do. Well, tell me then. What does England expect to do about it? Well, I'm just an Englishman and a writer, and I've spent some time in India, but I'm not a spokesman for the British government. Oh, no. Uh, may I, would it be impertinent of me if I were to ask you a question, just to get the ball rolling? Oh, go right ahead. Sure, shoot. Well, a moment ago, you referred to India as one-fifth of the world's population. I was wondering if you knew the composition of that population, what it's made up of. Yeah, well... They're Indians, I suppose. Oh, well, that's an intelligent... I guess that's not what you meant. Huh? Well, no. I, I'm just trying to get around to India's greatest problem. The endless division of peoples into castes, tribes, races, and states. A problem that existed long before an Englishman set foot in India. That may exist long after Britain leaves. That's what I was getting at. Oh. Now... Do you have any idea of the magnitude of these divisions? Yeah, well, only vaguely. But I suppose you're prepared to tell us all about it. Exactly. Now, India's total population is around 400 million. Oh, that's a lot of million. It's Are certainly you sure you won't have a drink? Uh, yes, thank you, I will. I'll make it for you. Thank you. Uh, the Hindus comprise the largest of the groups. 240 million of them. Soda or water? A uh, Water, please. Next, the Muslims, 100 million. That leaves 40 million to be divided among the Parsis, 
the Sikhs, Jains, and Buddhists. Yeah, never heard of them. <laughs> well, each of these peoples had their own language, their own religion, history, and custom. Now, let's concentrate on the two largest divisions, the Hindus and the Muslims. In these two groups, you have the basis of the biggest conflict in India. And if you want to know anything about Britain's position, you've got to understand the nature of these two peoples. Well, they have uh, different religions, haven't they? Yes, and a thousand other differences, too. Take Hinduism to begin with. What is Hinduism? Well, they have this caste system, I know that. And there's that sacred cow, can't eat meat or anything. And the untouchables. All right, let's start with the separation into castes. There are 2,500 castes in Hinduism. 2,500? Each with their own restrictions, privileges, and taboos. At the top of the ladder, the Brahmins. At the bottom, 60 million casteless ones, the untouchables. And they're the ones I feel sorry for. Well, I'd like to tell you about some of the personal experiences I had in India with this problem of caste. It's one of the most shocking things met by the Western mind in the East. Scene one is a small island off the west coast of India. A British subaltern in charge of an Indian training camp has just joined me on the porch of my bungalow. Oh, oh I'm drenched. How are you coming along, Nichols? Oh, trying like mad to rise above the heat. Not succeeding either. <sighs> Have a trying day? Rather. Trouble with the recruiting. Hmm. Aren't they joining up fast enough? Oh, they're coming in fast enough. Trouble is I have to send them away. You've lost me, old boy. Why do you have to send them away? Uh, look, over there. Standing under that eucalyptus tree. Ah. Those two chaps? Hmm. Well, don't tell me you rejected them. They look fine. I'll say they do. Up to par, mentally and physically. Two of the best volunteers I've had. But I had to send them away. Heaven's sake, why? They're untouchables. Sweeper class. Oh, that's preposterous. Uh, I suppose it is. But this is India, Nichols. India. If I took those two men in, and heaven knows I saw they need them, if I accepted them, the rest of the men would simply up and quit. Well, all the... Uh, no use getting stirred up, old boy. It's... One of the things you learn to put up with. Well, I wouldn't put up with it. Well, I have to. And I don't care to have another Indian mutiny on my hands. That's a cold-blooded attitude. Just doesn't make sense to me. And just a moment, my friends. There are other Hindu doctrines besides the caste system which makes progress equally difficult. Religious superstitions, for the most part. While I was in India, I got a very serious foot infection which kept me in hospital for some time. Strangely enough, it was there that I learned of many of these superstitions. One day, for example, my Eurasian nurse came into my room, obviously upset about something. Hello, nurse. Something wrong? Yes, Mr. Nichols. We're having trouble in one of the wards this morning. Oh, what sort of trouble? A girl with acute appendicitis. She ought to be operated on at once, but she won't let the doctor do it until tomorrow. Well, for heaven's sake, why not? Because this is not an auspicious day. It isn't? No. Well, what's the matter with today? It is not a lucky day in the religious calendar. Tomorrow is, but by then she will probably be dead. Nurse came in another morning, equally disturbed. Well, what's up this morning, nurse? More trouble? Yes, as you might expect. Well, draw up a chair and tell me all about it. Thank you, but I have not time to stay. A little boy's just arrived with 18 relations who insist on sleeping by his bed. Well, 18 relatives? Yes, parents... Grandparents, uncles, aunts, and what all. Three babies howling their heads off besides. It'd be funny if it were not tragic. This patient is supposed to have absolute quiet. My, well, uh, well, why don't you just get rid of them? Oh, no, no, we could not do that. If we so much as asked one of them to go, they'd take the boy away and he'd be dead before morning. No, we couldn't risk that. Of course, with all that uproar, the poor thing will probably die anyway. Eighteen relatives chattering and yowling around a dying boy. Yes, the picture horrified me, too. When the Hindu doctor came to see me, I asked him about this fantastic custom. That, Mr. Nichols, is a Hindu custom known as the joint family system. Mm -hmm. Does everybody get in on it? No, just the direct line of descent. The father, mother, son, and grandson, together with the corresponding women folk. Usually they live together under one roof. That is why it is called the joint family system. Joint in food, worship, and estate. And joint in expeditions to the hospital, I take it. That is all too often the case. But then, that is really one of the lesser problems with which we have to deal. The shortage of nurses, for example. That is a much more serious matter. 
What are the figures exactly, do you know? I mean the proportion of nurses to population. One nurse to every 65,000 Indians, Mr. Nichols. Well, why can't you train more? Again, Mr. Nichols, it is a matter of religion. Most Indian women consider nursing a dishonorable profession. Dishonorable? Why? Well, they feel they would degrade themselves by tending the sick and wounded. You see, they would have to minister to patients of all castes. Oh, it certainly is working against odds. You know, I heard today there are 60,000 TB cases in one city. Do they know why the TB rate is so high, Doctor? Well, in my opinion, at least 50% of it is due to purda. Ah, uh, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, purda is the Muslim custom of hiding the female face. Oh. Two narrow slits for the eyes, a tiny opening for the mouth. That is all the fresh air most women ever get. Seems possible. Yes, but, Doctor, if this costume is so unsanitary, can't something be done about it? Can't, can't they be told it breeds disease? I suppose it seems simple enough, but actually it is terribly difficult. We fight superstition year in and year out, uh, but not openly, of course. It would do no good to offend the religious feelings of the people. From what you are telling us, Mr. Nichols, I guess it takes a particular kind of mind and background to understand these people. Yes, it's something the Western mind finds difficult to grasp. But you English have been there 150 years. You're known by now. Yes, that's right. Perhaps you're right, gentlemen, but when you discuss India, you're dealing with one of the most complicated, twisted problems of our time. One-fifth of the world's population... Dominated by superstition, ridden with prejudice, torn by factional warfare. The powerful against the weak. The... Gentlemen, you look incredulous. What is it? Well, everyone tends to use the facts which support his own point of view. Not that I doubt you, Mr. Nichols, but... Oh, I see. Uh... You you regard all this as the rationalization of an Englishman. Yes, yeah, sure. Very well, then. It's time we heard from India herself. I'll let you hear the words of an eminent Indian leader, Dr. Ambedkar. Ambedkar? Yes, he, he's a non-caste Hindu and leader of the 60 million untouchables. Listen. The keynote of my policy, Mr. Nichols, is that we untouchables wish to be recognized as a separate element in the national life of India. We are not a subsection of the Hindus, as Gandhi claims. Gandhi says to us, trust the caste Hindus. But I say that Gandhi and the caste Hindus are our hereditary enemies. What do you believe must be done, Dr. Ambedkar? Why, I want to gather the untouchable minorities from every village and let them establish their own towns, places where they will be majorities with their own voice in government. This reorganization is a tremendous task, and we can only do it if we are allowed. And do you believe with the Indian Congress that it is time for Britain to quit India? Mr. Nichols, we are as patriotic as any of the Congress, but we do not want Britain to quit India till our rights are safeguarded. If they do, the fate of the untouchable minority will be worse than that of the oppressed peoples of Europe. I've never heard of any Indians wanting England to stay in India. Yeah, I read about it somewhere. Those, my friends, are the words of a casteless Hindu, not a British spokesman. An untouchable who has himself risen from the depths, risen above insult and superstition to become the champion of his people. Well, maybe so, but I don't think she's smart or practical about it. Any attempt to segregate people is bound to promote isolationism of one sort or another, and eventually isolationism breeds distrust and conflict. <laughs> you don't convince easily, do you? All right, I'll bring you the opinion of another Indian, a man who is the leader of Pakistan. Pakistan? What's that? Oh, I know. That's what the Muslims want, isn't it? Yes, that is what the 100 million Muslims want. Here's what it is, very briefly. They want to establish an independent state in those parts of India where the people are largely Muslim. These people want a separate state because they feel they're completely in conflict with the Hindus. Conflicts of religion, customs, language... Well, wait a minute, Mr. Nichols. Suppose there are conflicts. What of it? People have resolved their differences in other nations. Why not India? Well, if I answer that question, you'll say I'm prejudiced. Again, I'd rather have an Indian bring us the facts. This man is Mr. M.A. Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League. I first met him on December the 18th, 1943, and asked him, Mr. Jinnah, how would you define the principles of Pakistan? In five words, Mr. Nichols, the Muslims are a nation. When you say that, 
Are you thinking in terms of religion? Certainly religion, but more than that also. Our religion, Islam, is also a practical code of conduct. So you see, I am thinking in terms of life. In terms of our history, our art, our law. Uh, please, I'd like to write that down. Of course. You see, in all these things, the attitude of the Muslims is not only different from that of the Hindus, but sometimes completely opposed. In fact, there is nothing in life which links us together. Our names, our clothes, our foods, they are all different. Our economic life, our educational ideas, our treatment of women. We challenge each other at every point of the compass. What have you written down? <laughs> I, um, um, the Muslims are a nation. <laughs> and do you believe it? Yes, I do. <laughs> what other questions do you have, Mr. Nichols? Mr. Jinnah, you know, of course, the critics of Pakistan claim that the idea was created by Britain Rubbish. in order... Rubbish, that's a nonsense. In fact, it is the opposite which is true. What the British have created is the myth of United India... A myth that has no basis in flesh and blood. A myth that will cause endless conflict. For this once at least, divide and rule does not apply. What you would prefer then is divide and quit. Exactly, Mr. Nichols. You have put it very neatly. Let the British divide and quit. Divide and quit, huh? Well, all I can say is the problem of India seems a bit more complicated than I thought. Yeah, but but uh, here's the thing. I've learned a great deal tonight, but uh, tell me, Mr. Nichols, don't you think the British bear some responsibility for India? Now, they've ruled India for 150 years. I mean, don't you think they've made a few errors here and there? Bravo for you, sir. I certainly do, and I'd be the last to deny it. And not just a few errors here and there, either. The British have made blunders of colossal magnitude in India. Let's look into some of these. First, the problem of the English personality. English personality? Yes, yes. The people who work for the British government in India. Oh, I don't mean all of them, to be sure. The ones I'm thinking of have become famous the world over. Those ancient figures of Noel Coward comedies, the Pukka Saib and his Mem Saib yelling for Chota Pegs at sundown. <laughs> I'll tell you about one of these. I was about to board a train, and the coolies who had carried my luggage were waiting to be paid. After their hard work in the burning sun, I didn't have the heart to just pay them without a word of thanks. So I turned to the English colonel who was with me. I say, Colonel, what Indian for thank you? Oh, uh, what, old boy? Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. By my dear fellow. <coughs> you just don't. I'm afraid I, I... You don't say thank you? Certainly not. Never. It's done. As a matter of fact, don't believe there is such a word. Been in India 30 years. Never heard anybody say thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, everywhere I went in India, I asked that. What is the word for thank you? Nobody, neither the British nor the Indians, seemed to feel the lack of that word. Of course, there is a rough translation. Nobody used it, that's all. You see, the British who live in India, that colonel and others like him, they don't really live in India at all. They're present physically, but their hearts are in the highlands of Piccadilly. Let's go back to my colonel on the train. I say, Nichols, are you really going to write a book about India? Why, you've only been here a year. Well, I've done some pretty careful studying. And a I... year? Gat, man. I've been out here over 30 years. I don't know a thing about it. I was tempted to say no, and if you stay out here for another 30 years, you'll still be as ignorant. But I didn't. Instead, I said, Tell me, Colonel, have you ever seen an Indian movie? <coughs> Rather not. Why, they're fearful things, Indian films. Perhaps, but you can get a good insight into Indian psychology from their movies. No, thank you. I'll leave that to you, Ryder Jeff. Not me. In all the time you've been here, Colonel, have you ever spent the night in an Indian village? <laughs> what an odd question. <coughs> really, old boy. Sleep among all those bugs and crawly things? <laughs> Not really. What about friends, Colonel? In your 30 years here, have you had any real Indian friends? Friends? Well, uh, let me see now. I don't see why not. I know some quite decent Indians. As a matter of fact, really, some quite decent Indians. But, uh... <clears throat> I, uh, wouldn't exactly call them friends. <laughs> Friends? 
There you have it. A great, vacuous, desolate, spiritual isolation in the midst of a continent alive with a conflict of ideas and cultures. In this failure to become part of the country, only the British are to blame. But there have been worse sins than that, of course. Sins of omission, perhaps, but sins nevertheless. I learned about this when I went to visit a friend of mine at Delhi. He was an official in the Department of Industry. Hello, Nichols. Have any trouble finding me? Well, uh, a little. Uh, I say, is this the Department of Industry? Yes, and the Department of Health and Department of Education, too. Why? But I... I... Do you mean to say that three government departments are crowded into this one office? Oh, it does seem rather small, I suppose. Ah, oh, but then we, we manage. You do? Uh, what? 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 What do you manage to do? That's what I came here to find out, you know. What has your department done, for example, to promote industrial development in India? Well, now, cotton, steel, people, cement, they've all grown quite rapidly in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. What about the heavy industries? Automobiles, shipping, armaments. Mm, not so good there, I'm afraid. You might say, well, they're more or less stagnated. In other words, the government really hasn't done much of anything to promote industry here, is that it? Uh, not much, certainly. Well, here's a figure I'd like to get. What percentage of the Indian population is employed in industry? About 4%, a little over. 4%? After 150 years of rule by one of the most highly industrialized powers in the world, 4%. Doesn't sound very good, does it? I'll say not. What about the Indian Congress's claim that Britain has done this deliberately? Purposely kept the country in a state of industrial backwardness. You've heard that, of course. Rather. And I'm very much afraid the facts support the charge. There were attempts to set up an Indian chemical industry, for example, but it was scotched by the government. It tried to establish a match industry, too, but it met the same fate. Competition with British industry, eh? Uh, <coughs> well, yes. Yes, Nichols. Something like this. Yes, that interview made me pretty sick at heart. But when I listened to an Indian agricultural expert, I discovered even worse things. You see, Mr. Nichols, what happens to Indian agriculture can affect the condition of the whole country. Eighty percent of the people are directly engaged in farming. It's a very sad picture, I am afraid. Most Indian farmers live in terms of the Middle Ages. Modern farm tools, rotation of crops, fertilizers, all these are unknown. As a result, the land becomes poorer and poorer with each succeeding year. And has the British government done anything to relieve the situation? Only one thoroughly constructive thing, and that is a matter of irrigation. The British have constructed here the largest system of irrigation in the world. It is a magnificent piece of work, truly, but the success of it only points up the failure to do anything about the other vital problems, not only farming problems either. What are you thinking of? A social pest, Mr. Nichols, a bloodsucker that plagues the Indian farmer from the cradle to the grave, that ravages his land and destroys his will. The Banya. Banya? I thought that meant moneylender. That is exactly what it does mean. Do you know that the farmers of India pay more to the moneylender by way of interest than they pay to the government in taxes? Interest as high as 50 and 75 percent? Yes. And the banyas are the worst pestilence the Indian farmer has to contend with. But I thought there were laws passed, laws that restricted the interest to 18 percent. Yes, but these laws have not been enforced. The Banya thrives today as always. Mr. Nichols, your willingness to admit some of these faults of British rule, it's very commendable, I think, but haven't you left out something? What's that? Well, admitting the terrible internal problems of India, all of that. Isn't it true that two out of every ten people in England make their living from the Indian Empire? Yes, I think Churchill himself said that. Yes, he did. You see what I'm getting at? I mean, Britain didn't colonize India for altruistic reasons. It represents a sizable portion of England's national income, doesn't it? Yes, you're right about that. So right. And that brings us to the moral question. Should Britain quit India? In my mind, the answer is emphatically yes. If the Atlantic Charter means anything, if the whole war means anything, the answer must be yes. And equally on moral grounds, this yes must recognize the sovereignty of the two great Indian nations, the Hindus and the Muslims. 
However, it's much simpler to answer that question than the two which follow from it. Can Britain quit India and will Britain quit India? Before I left the country, I discussed these two questions with a young Indian friend. That's what I believe, Mr. Nichols. Yes, yes, Nadu. I believe, too, that England should quit. But surely you don't believe it can be done overnight. India would be left almost defenseless from aggression. But, Mr. Nichols, if India gains her freedom, she's willing, nay, eager to defend herself. My dear Nadu, may I ask with what? With what will India defend herself? With barge poles? With sticks and stones? Ah, and whose fault is that? Whose fault is it that India is so weak? Whose fault that we have no navy, no air force? No munitions factories? But don't you see, Nadu, these, these are rhetorical questions. It, it doesn't matter how you answer them, the fact remains. All right, let's say it's the fault of the British. Can India defend herself from aggression? Other nations have developed an army. We can do the same. Of course you can, but we are discussing the question of whether Britain can leave India now, not 20 years from now. And 20 years is the time it would take to create an Indian army. Well, let us come to your other question then. It is the one which interests me most. Tell me, will Britain quit India? <laughs> ah, there, Mr. Nichols. There's the question I've been waiting for, too. What answer did you give to Nadu? When you come right down to it, I guess the whole world wants to hear the answer to that one. It's the $64 question, all right. What do you say, Mr. Nichols? Will Britain quit India? Gentlemen, that is the most interesting question. And at the same time, the most difficult. As a matter of fact... I do not have the answer to it. Yeah, but huh? you've written... But I know who has. Oh. You do? Tell us. The Indian people themselves. Within their hands lies the power to fashion an answer which will be a mighty and unequivocal yes. Because after all is said and done, no one is in a better position to solve India's internal problems than her own people. Her giant clashes of nation against nation, caste against caste, superstition against progress. These great boulders in the path of democracy and well-being. When they are removed, then Britain will quit India. For the time being, these are the signs of hope for Indian freedom. As every day goes by, the Muslim nation opens its eyes a little wider. The untouchables raise their heads a little higher. And most important of all, more lights begin to flood the stage. The audience, you gentlemen here, and the millions like you all over the world, are beginning to realize that the drama of India is not so simple as you once believed. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you Verdict on India by Beverly Nichols. The radio dramatization was by Edward Jurist. The cast included Horace Braham as Beverly Nichols, Joe DeSantis, Ed Begley, William Thornton, Bert Tanswell, Raleigh Bester, Don Morrison, and Jackson Beck. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of The Secret State by Jan Karski. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.